everyone. Thanks for joining. This is Seeking Sustainability Live, a special Saturday edition, which is sometimes called Catter Day. So perfect for today's topic. I'm talking with Selena Hoy and Elizabeth Tasker, who have previously been in the series talking about their expertise with planets and writing about Japan. And today they are talking about TNR and rescuing and neutering and releasing stray cats. So we got a lot to talk about. Thanks so much for joining, guys. Thanks for having us, JJ. It's great to see you again. Would you mind just briefly introducing yourself, how you got interested in helping the stray cats in your area? Go ahead, Elizabeth. Oh, okay. <laughs> Uh, hi, yes, I'm Elizabeth, and I got probably most involved in helping stray cats due to the COVID-19 pandemic, which meant I was in my neighborhood an awful lot more than I was usually. Normally I leave in the morning, I go to work, I come back in the evening, and I didn't really see uh, many cats around, but suddenly I was teleworking. And I realized that we had um, a lot of cats uh, around our neighborhoods that were not spay or neutered. And honestly, some of them were involved in pretty explicit acts right outside my balcony window. And I thought that, um, you know, this was something that maybe I could help with. And the final clincher actually came when I was walking home one morning and I saw uh, just a few blocks from my house, um, a dead kitten on the side of the roadside. And this kitten had the same coat coloring as my pet cat that I'd actually just lost to a sudden illness. And I just thought this this needs to end. Like I, you know, there was no need for this to happen. I was really sad, especially that, you know, there was a cat literally dying for a home. Only a few blocks away where there was a home desperately short of a cat. Um, and I, I really wanted to do more than just adopt a cat, which I did. Um, I also wanted to help the other ones out there. And so I started looking into ways of TNR, trap, neuter and return. And, uh, which both prolongs the life of the cat, so it improves their life a great deal. And also, of course, stops stray kittens that, you know, would, most of which will probably die. It's, it's so worthwhile. What did I, I hear that if you, in one cat's life, they can have up to 300 kittens, if you talk about the kittens they have that then have kittens, or it's an amazing amount that really if you do TNR, even if you don't keep them as pets, you can really help to decrease the population in just by helping one, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Selena, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Um, so plus one to everything Elizabeth just said. Um, so I'm Selena and I got involved with um, doing animal rescue and trap neuter return in 2011 during the uh, big earthquake and tsunami here in Japan. So before that, I had been an animal lover. I've had animals all my life, but um, that is where I learned how to trap a cat and why we should do that. And so I was volunteering up in Fukushima, up in Tohoku um, for about a year, actually, doing animal rescue in the like radiated zone. And uh, learned how to operate a cat trap, learned um, basically was running a shelter <laughs> and uh, d dealt with an enormous number of animals in a very short time. So I went from like relative newbie to um, relative expert in the span of about six months. And I think in our talk, uh, you also talked about being an escort for pets that were being adopted around Japan, like traveling with them on airplane or or train as well. So you've actually been involved with a lot of different stages of rescuing pets, doing TNR, and also adoption as well. That's right. So TNR is a really important tool in our tool chest. And I think it's the, the best and most basic one that we can do, which is, as Elizabeth said, it's trap, neuter, return, or trap, neuter, release. Uh, and that's when you take a cat that's living in the neighborhood um, trap them, take them to the vet, get them spayed or neutered, and then return them to their environment so that they continue to live in the neighborhood as a stray cat, um, but they're not going to pop, you know, repopulate, like you said, and they are less likely to fight. They're less likely to make a bunch of noise and piss off the neighbors. Um, 
and they're less likely to die of horrible diseases because a lot of those diseases come from fighting and uh, having relations with other cats in the neighborhood. Um, but we often found that if a cat was friendly, then you know that cat could be rehomed into a, into an adoption situation. So we did both. We did both trap neuter return TNR, and also if a cat uh, seemed like they would like to live indoors, then um, we would we would find a suitable home for them. Nice. And uh, we in my in my case as well, we have taken in uh, two kittens every year uh, for the last two years. <laughs> And we had one of the kittens adopted to friends of all via Twitter. People on Twitter have been so supportive. I think, Selena, you gave me such great advice while I was doing it the second time. There's things I forgot about trapping um, that I had done the first time. Um, so I'd love to hear about uh, your more recent experience, because even though it's only less than a year since I did it recently, I think there's things I've forgotten. But Elizabeth, you did it really recently with Cassie, was it? Or Masaki? Can you take us through one of your stories recently? Doing a, a lot of TNR. I started in December and we've done seven cats since then. Um, and in most cases, it's straightforward TNR. So I see a cat that I'm like, yes, you, you need to be uh, spayed and neutered. Um, and Normally, I, I put the trap down when I see that particular cat that's around. So the trap um, doesn't need, uh, I mean, you, you, I'm sorry, I had to put this. Um, obviously, you don't know exactly what cat you will get in a trap if you just put it out. Um, typically, when I do it, I, I see the cat and then I put the trap nearby with something really tasty inside it, normally wet food that smells very strongly. And um, the cat can't resist, so I, I've backed off, but I can still see the trap. And then the cat walks into the trap. Um, there's a there's a pressure plate, and when they put their paw on it, the trap snaps shut behind them. Uh, typically, at that moment, they will panic really quite reasonably. So it's quite good if you have a towel or a sheet and you can just throw it over the trap so it goes dark, and they're like, "Oh, okay, it's night suddenly." Um, and then um, I normally. Uh, take them briefly into my apartment and I either take them to the vet that day or I take them to the vet the next day if I've trapped in the evening. And um, if they're a boy, it's actually a very quick procedure. They're normally done the following day. Uh, if they're a girl, it is a little bit more invasive. And the vet that Selena and I use um, is prepared at really a very cheap rate to keep them for two or three nights. And that means that when I get them back, I can return them straight away. I don't have to um, set up accommodation in my apartment. Um, and so that's normally what I've done. And then for the healthy cats, you know, the TNR is very straightforward. There's not really any problems. I normally get back a cat that's very annoyed and angry at me, uh, but then I return it uh, to the same location. It shoots off without a backwards glance. And normally I don't see it again for uh, several days or several weeks because it's very, very irritated at me. But because I regularly put food out outside my apartment, um, normally uh, they get over their huff and say, well, fine, if you're going to feed me, I'll come back. <laughs> And then yeah. um, with the TNR, they get the ear tip. So um, this is really important because it means you know the cat has been TNR'd. Now for cats with um, strong markings, like you can see there, a little calico kitten, it's quite easy to recognize them again. But there are cats which, especially if they're shy and you don't see them up close, it's very hard to spot if you've got the same cat without that TNR tip. So I had a case recently where Selena and I had TNR'd a black cat that I called Juliet for her amorous dealings outside my apartment. And uh, I TNR'd her and released her. And then a little while later, I saw another black cat and I was like, oh, it's Juliet back again. And it was only as this cat got a little more confident and I was able to get a closer look, did I realize that this black cat had no tipped ear. So actually it was a different cat. This one was male that I called Jules because I'd been calling him Juliet and then realized that it wasn't Juliet. So <laughs> he got renamed Jules. <laughs> And I took him to the vet very recently and he was um, he got uh, neutered overnight. And then I, I just recently released him. So that's the most straightforward case. It's very easy. Um, at most, I've kept the cat in the apartment for one night only. I typically put them in my bathroom. Uh, you do need to keep an eye on it because they are Houdinis when it comes to escape antics. But uh, if you shut the door firmly and preferably have two doors <laughs> so you have a, an airlock if they do escape, then it's not really a problem. 
Um, and then the, the bathroom, of course, can be very easily washed down afterwards. So if they decide they don't want to use a litter box you've given them, it's not it's no big deal. Yeah. And then um, the vet does everything and you return straight away afterwards. So it's, it's very little hassle. And I wouldn't want anyone to be put off thinking it's going to be a big deal because it's just not going to be. It's going to be very simple. Yeah, uh, it is really case by case, though, in, in my experience, some are easy to catch and easy to train and easy to get in cages and others are not. Um, but having the right equipment and being prepared is definitely really important. Uh, I see we've got Dave in Osaka who joined us. Thanks, Dave. Uh, Dave actually adopted one of my uh, caught kittens from the first litter two years ago. And exactly like you guys said, um, if they don't clip the ear, like I took both of the mothers in, I trapped both of the mothers and took them in to get spayed or neutered. And um, they refused for whatever reason to clip the ear. I see them all the time and they are impossible to tell the difference between them and the other strays who I know are not spayed or neutered. So I would definitely insist on getting the ear clipped. And the, the vet was saying, well, I thought you wanted to keep them as a pet. But from the get go, when they saw how crazy they were in the cage, <laughs> they should have known. And I was saying, this is the mom. It's too old to ever become a pet. I think I this is not going to be a pet. Um, but even so, they didn't clip. So I, you know, and then there's the added cost. So Selena and Elizabeth, I'm so happy to hear that you guys were also able to get some of the subsidy back. So Selena, you want to tell us a little bit about funding and costs? Um, so it is really important to find a rescue friendly vet. A lot of vets are not rescue friendly. They don't know how to deal with strays. Um, if they don't deal with strays, they don't know the kinds of diseases and parasites that strays get. So they're not used to dealing with that. So, um, you know, if you can find a rescue friendly vet, that's really important. Um, it's not always easy. Um, and then the other thing you mentioned is subsidies. So many places in Japan do have subsidies. My city, which is Machida City in Tokyo, has a program where they will give you back uh, 5,000 yen for a girl and 2,500 yen for a boy for each surgery you do. You have to have a form that you fill out and the vet has to stamp it, but um, that does help a little bit. And then our vet also has rescue prices for strays. So their, their surgery costs are very cheap um, compared to, you know, it can cost uh, two, three, five mon even um, to get a, a, a cat spayed or neutered at a regular vet. So uh, if you if you search for, let's see, I have to think of some search terms, but if you search for like TNR or Chti um, Kineko or um, some of these terms, I can, I can give you some terms to drop down. Oh, that'd be then great. You, um, you may find a... Even if you that, write them, you could write them in the comments now and okay. then... Uh, people might be able to see them. Um, I checked with the city government. I checked uh, with the the vet. I, I was asking around. Uh, I know it's really area by area, whether they have campaigns to help out with TNR um, and other funding. I was told by the local government in Hiroshima that as an individual, I would not be able to get funding. And I know you mentioned this uh, for you and Elizabeth, you have registered as individuals in order to get funding. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how that works? Yeah, it's really a case by case basis. As you said, you just have to check to see if your city has it. You, you would check with the Hokenjo, the um, city, uh, um, it, it's kind of the pound, the city pound, the Hokenjo, and see if they have a program. With us, we didn't have to register anything. We just have to download the forms. But actually, they do give more money if you're a registered group. Um, I'm not sure if you have to be registered as a nonprofit or just as a Dante, an organization. Um, but if you are, then you can actually get even a little bit more money towards the, the program since you're kind of official. But with us, uh, we just have to download the forms and have the vet stamp it and then send it into the city. And they'll, wow. they, I think it took a month to get the the money back. Ah, oh, that's all right. That helps a lot because um, when I did it, he gave me a discount, but still, it was fifteen thousand for males and twenty thousand for females, and that 
adds up, especially if they're not going to become your pets. You know, you're trying to do something good for the community and you can't keep doing it if it's at that price. Now, I had a chance to talk with Hart Tokushima's founder, and one of the things that she is setting up is a TNR clinic where she has vets volunteering their time. It's at a very discount price. Um, I think it was about 5,000 yen per animal, and that really helps. So even if it's, it is your own pet, it's still discounted. So it still encourages people to get the, the pet spayed and neutered, which helps in case they do run away or get abandoned, right? Uh, Elizabeth, do you want to talk a little bit about uh, how you've been trapping? You've been very good at trapping. I've been very impressed. Um, it took me a long time to learn how to use the trap. What's your technique? So I would say, as you actually hinted at, JJ, it does depend on the cat. Um, so the black cat I mentioned previously, Juliet. I think I tried about 8,463 times before I actually trapped her. I mean, ballpark figure, but pretty accurate. Um, she was really wily. And I actually bought a trap off Amazon and it just wasn't sensitive enough. It was, uh, it had a hook and then you're supposed to be able to press down the plate and that hook should snap off and the door should close. But you've got to push down pretty hard on that plate. And possibly if Juliet had been a large Tom, I would have had no problem, but she was, she was a wily little cat and she would walk into the trap, eat all the food and just walk out again. It was the most frustrating thing ever. And she did this time and time again. And I would send pictures and videos to Selena saying, oh, it's lunchtime. Guess what I'm doing? Yes, that's a trap. That's Juliet in it. No, it hasn't closed. <laughs> and in the ah, end, um, I had to so give up on that trap. Yeah. It was it was very frustrating, especially because for Juliet, um, I strongly suspected that she was pregnant, like she was in heat. She'd certainly been doing the right activities to get pregnant. So, and it was winter, like the kittens didn't stand a chance. Like I really wanted to trap her before it was too late. Um, I mean, ideally you want to trap the cat before they're pregnant, but for, for me personally, I feel stopping an early stage pregnancy is, is okay. Because if you let the cat, I mean, keeping the cat for the whole pregnancy would be incredibly stressful on the cat. And the kittens born in winter, I mean, there's there's no chance for them. They just die. So I was really keen to catch her. Um, and in the end, I borrowed another trap. I think actually Selena was away or um, she has a fantastic trap that's also very sensitive for kittens, which I currently have in my bathroom. Um, but uh, I think she'd, she'd either lent it to a friend or she wasn't around at the time. Uh, but I had another friend who I found through the Japan Cat Network, um, Axel, who was living quite close to me. And he said, no problem. He said, I've got a trap. It should be more sensitive. And he brought it um, to, to my place. And this one, rather than having a hook, it was a door with a small hole in it. And you have a stick that slides through the hole. And you just rest it right on the edge of that stick. And then when the paw goes down on that, um, that step pad, the stick slides out and the door drops. And you can quite easily make that quite sensitive. So I used that trap and I finally got hold of Juliet that way. Um, and we had no problem and took her to the vet. Uh, but since then, I kind of gave up on the hook trap. And I've used yeah. either the one with the, the door and the hole or um, Selena's trap. Um, it, it has a hook, but it's, it's not actually hooked on it. It basically just balances the door open. Is that right? So, you know, you can easily make it quite sensitive and it's designed for kittens. So you don't need a lot of force on it. Yeah, um, I, I had one of the I'll show I'll go and grab it in a second because I keep it outside just in case I need to do any more TNRing. Um, but I it's a silver one and I got it from Amazon. And I like you said, I didn't have much uh, luck with the the pad that they would step on. It didn't seem to to trap them at the right time. Um, but I got some advice from YouTube and I actually put a pet bottle like a plastic bottle at the end and I tied a piece of string and I waited inside the house. And when I saw that they were safely inside, then I would pull the bottle out and it would trap them. And so I, I knew I wasn't uh, getting any of, you know, their tail or anything, you know, halfway in or something. And I just, I felt that that worked a bit better. And I did that the next time. 
as well. Um, but yeah, finding a good trap, trying to finding a method that works that you feel you're not going to hurt the animal, but also you're going to really catch them because if you miss, then you've probably missed your chance to catch them because they're unlikely to come around again. Right. Yeah, so that's correct. That, um, most cats won't be trapped twice. They're too smart for that. Kittens are, uh, on the other hand, are often dumb and you can trap them multiple times. But um, something that you mentioned that I want to expand on is uh, Elizabeth mentioned Axel. And Axel is somebody I actually know. He was up in Fukushima at the same time as me working for the same organization um, doing animal rescue. He's more of a dog person, but he likes cats too. And um, there is uh, an organization called Japan Cat Network, which I was working with in 2011. But in addition to the organization, they have a Facebook page which has hundreds of people, hundreds of cat lovers all over Japan. I believe Elizabeth may have actually connected with Axel through the Facebook page. I'm not sure. But there are a lot of people all over Japan who have a lot of experience with rescuing, who um, may be able to lend you a trap or help you. And so that's a really good place to go, the Facebook page specifically, if you want advice um, or if you want to try to borrow a trap or if you want to find a rescue-friendly vet. Um, people there have a lot of knowledge and they're always happy to help when it comes to helping out a cat in need. So I recommend finding the page on Facebook and asking your questions there if you don't know of a rescue vet or if you can't find a trap in your area. That's really good advice. And I wish the ward office would lend you these traps because if you see a, a cat or kittens around your area and you want to try to trap them to pay to do TNR or to try to adopt them, um, this is definitely something the municipalities should be supporting, I would think, whether they give funding or not. Having the trap that works well is is a big hurdle when you're first starting to get, you know, interested in helping out, right? I think actually Kawasaki does. Um, so in Kawasaki City, there is a big TNR center. I have not visited it, but it's it's very clearly labelled as TNR, and on their website they say they do rent traps. So sometimes you you may find that's possible too. I, I think you may be talking about the big TNR vet in Kawasaki, and I don't know if they're associated with the city. But yeah, we used to use them a lot at JCN. But but you're right that some cities municipalities may have it. Um, another thing that since you brought that up, I want to mention is that. The kill rate in Japan for cats especially is extremely high. So you don't, if you, if you don't want the cat to be scooped up and then taken and gassed, uh, please don't call the city to come and deal with a cat because that's more than likely what will happen. Again, it depends on municipality. Some have very low kill rates, but overall an enormous number of animals are killed in the, um, I wouldn't call them shelters, in the pound. Uh, in Japan. So that's another reason to do TNR. So we don't have all these animals that either die in the elements or get killed at the pound. Yeah, very good point. And I think that it's one of the reasons uh, we have great organizations like Heart Tokushima in, in Tokushima Shikoku, Japan, and ARC. I know that you know Animal Refuge Kansai as well. And um, in Tokyo, you must have networks like that who are trying to support people uh, trying to adopt or neuter. Is that right? In the Tokyo area as well? Right. If you are looking for organizations, uh, I would try HART. I would try ARC, our Animal, Animal Refuge Kansai. They actually have a branch in Tokyo as well. And then again, the Japan Cat Network page um, they do adoptions themselves as an organization, and they also, on their Facebook page, a lot of people are adopting to each other. And if you do it, if you do an adoption on their page, they require that you follow rules like making sure that it's a good home, you know, requiring vet care and things like that. So we actually found um, a home for one of our. TNR cats through the Japan Cat Network. So normally, as I mentioned, we, we return them because they're they used to be on the streets. They're not friendly. Um, you know, put it adopting a cat that is feral 
is you know it's 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 not impossible but it's extremely difficult because they're not pets and they don't want particularly to be with humans they don't want to live indoors they're actually very happy on the street but you can improve their health vastly with the TNR um, but sometimes you see a cat where that's not the case. Um, and actually you showed a picture of uh, an orange cat called Masaki that I did rescue. Now him, I was walking home from the supermarket one day, that's him, yes. And he was um, on the side of the road in terrible condition. He was rail thin, he was barely standing up. I put down some food and he dashed over to it. And I thought this is not a TNR case, this cat needs desperate help. So yes, there that was him when I first saw him. And that was the picture I took and sent to Selena because obviously, you know, my, my first port of call was to go onto Facebook <laughs> and message Selena and say, I've, I've got a situation here. Can we save this cat? And Selena said to me, we can save this cat. You trap him and we'll sort it. So I dashed home, which is about five or 10 minutes away, grabbed a trap, came back and he was so hungry. He wasn't friendly, but he was so hungry. He basically walked into the trap um, and Selena, I think, actually came up to my apartment and rescued us. And we took him straight to the vet. Uh, do not pass go, do not collect $200. Um, and we took him to our TNR vet, who was truly, truly fabulous, actually. Um, and he said to us, he was very honest, and he said, it's touch and go. He said, I don't know whether we can save him, but if you want to try, we'll give it a shot. And so he was covered with fleas. He was terribly malnourished. He had kidney problems. I mean, his blood works were awful. Um, and we did it. He stayed in the vet clinic for one week. And of course, they did charge us for that, but still at a ridiculously reasonable price. I mean, I forget how much we paid, but it was like a few man um, for a week's stay with antibiotics on a drip. Like <laughs> they gave him the works and they did it for an incredibly cheap rate for us. And then they they called us up and said, he's not out the woods yet. You can't release him, but he could probably be cared for at home now. He can take the medicine orally. And so I set up a cage in my apartment and he stayed with me for, was it another month, Selena? At least that, wasn't it? Maybe six weeks. And at the end of that period, I thought, I don't want to put him back outside. I mean, he's clearly failed completely as an outside cat. So I don't want to just put him back out there. He might just, the same thing might happen again. But he wasn't friendly. Um, in fact, I would say he was astonishingly ungrateful for all the effort we'd put in. <laughs> he was still <laughs> not not petable. Um, and uh, really, you know, he was very calm inside. He didn't want to escape particularly, but he didn't want to be picked up and cuddled either. And I thought, gosh, are we really going to find a home for a cat that this, that this is difficult? And in the end, I put his story on the Japan Cat Network Facebook page. And I said, is there anyone who's up for a challenge? And I didn't think anyone would reply. And they did. Someone did. Um, my friend Kelly wrote to us and said, when I was growing up, I had a ginger cat that looks very much like this one. Um, I want to help this cat. And I said to her, do you understand that you probably can't touch him? And you may that may change in the future, but I can't guarantee it. He may never become super friendly. And she was like, I completely understand. And it's OK. And so um, we visited her apartment and we brought we brought him round and we're still in regular contact. Uh, you can see us all there in the, the bottom right corner. And uh, he was originally in a cage just to give him a place that he was familiar with, but um, Kelly let him out pretty quickly. And now as far as I can see, he is king of her apartment and she just does his bidding. And uh, he's doing fantastically. He's, he's a different cat. He's, you know, he's got his gorgeous deep orange eyes. He's got a glossy coat. He plays with all the toys. It, it's it makes me happy every single time Kelly sends me a photo. Aww. What a wonderful story of success. And I, I think it is possible. And like you said, even when you're trying so hard uh, to domesticate them, to take care of them, you're spending a lot of money and effort and time and giving them the food that they like, you're doing everything right. And you're not getting that response like you expect them to start appreciating you. <laughs> And we, we had a similar thing. Uh, let's talk a little bit about techniques, though. How can you get a feral cat that you think has potential to become a pet? What can you do um, to start to get them used to people or to start to trust you? Who wants to shall talk I, about that? Yeah. Shall I start, Slida? And then Slida's probably got a bit more experience than me. But in my experience, the, the key has been you know, to take your cues from the cat. I've had very different experiences depending on the cat. 
So Cassie, who you've got a very nice picture of there, she was um, rescued actually at the same time uh, with, with Selena's group in, in Fukushima. Um, and she was at the shelter for 10 years. And although she was very happy and comfortable there, she didn't get a lot of one-on-one -on -one attention because obviously it's a, it's a large cat shelter. And she never has become very friendly. And so um, I adopted Cassie in December last year and she couldn't be stroked or touched but I found that fluffy stick there, she would tolerate. And the shelter advised me on that. They said, she will probably tolerate gentle strokes with a fluffy stick, why don't you give it a go? And, and she did. And gradually we've built up from there. So she liked the fluffy stick. And now more recently she discovered she loves being brushed. In fact, she's become a brush demon. And now she meows almost continuously to be brushed. And I'm expected to do that at all hours of the day and night. Um, and with that, she's also, um, now started to accept gentle, short scratches with my hand directly, uh, but that's quite new. And I don't do it for very long. I watch her very carefully because I, I like my hand and fingers intact. <laughs> so I take my cue very clearly from her. We, we don't tend to have any problems. And I, I was trying a similar thing with the ginger cat Masaki. I was using a stick to gently stroke him and he was tolerating that and building up from there. Um, and sometimes you have more or less luck than that. There was uh, the little calico kitten um, I, I, you've shown some photos of. She's one of my TNRs. She was not remotely friendly when I trapped her. In fact, Selena and I have a video of me trying to release her and uh, the, the carrier she's in has a mesh front to the cage and she lashed out with her claws. So I had to be really careful in undoing it. Like she was not, she was not up for being picked up. And I, I released her and returned her. And I would occasionally see her around and I put food down. And then one day, completely randomly, she suddenly shows up on my balcony and I opened the curtains one morning and she was just outside, like directly on the balcony itself, which she'd never come to before, with a look that said, hi, I'm your cat, don't you remember? <laughs> I was like, actually, I, I did not remember, but okay, we can roll with this. And she basically domesticated herself, I've done very little she's just decided that she wants more contact so I started feeding her on the balcony directly um, which is great because it annoyed my neighbors less and she took food from my hand and as she was taking food from my hand I would gently use the other hand to start to tickle her on the you know around the side of her face and she initially would tolerate that as long as she was distracted with food but afterwards would be like no don't touch me but she also then got used to it and I can stroke her now, I can hold her. Um, I'm getting her used to being picked up. Um, she now comes inside the apartment. That picture with the stuffed cow is hilarious because it was her first time on the sofa and she suddenly spotted this plush toy of a cow and was just like, what is this? <laughs> is this a cat? What have you done to it? <laughs> she has uh, some of the best expressions I've ever seen in any cat. And I'm hoping that in the future I might fully adopt her and she would come and live inside. Uh, but that was really her. I did very little work there. I've never seen that before. Um, so for other cats like Cassie and Masaki, it's been a more slow progress, getting them used to sticks and brushes and then eventually hands. Though Cassie has also become more friendly uh, seeing Nora. Um, so this little calico I called Nora Neko, which actually means stray cat in Japanese. And so I called her Nora. Um, and seeing Nora get petted has increased Cassie's confidence. And she's like, oh, well, Nora survived that, maybe I will survive that too. And Selena also told me the same thing, that a shy cat with a less shy cat will gain confidence from the one that has more confidence. Is that right, Selena? Yes, that's the case. I, I, that's the case. I think Elizabeth touched on most everything that I would suggest. Um, one thing I'd say is that if you get kittens, handle them often and as much as possible, as young as possible. Um, from one or two months when they can be safely weaned from their mo mothers, then if you handle them a lot, then they will grow up socialized. If you are coming to an adult cat that's not socialized, it's going to be, some, some will be able to be socialized and some just won't. But all of those tips with lots of food and treats um, and then letting them, um, being quiet with them and letting them decide how much they want to come to you versus you always trying to molest them, I think makes a big difference. If they feel they can trust you not to chase them around, then they maybe will come to you in their own time. 
Yeah, I think that's such great advice. And that whole concept of case by case was certainly um, our experience. Uh, the first kittens that we rescued, it was during a really heavy rainstorm. They were all really sick. And that's the reason that I decided, even though I'm scared to go and try to catch them, I've got to do it because I really felt like they were going to die. Okay. So what would you say is the, the normal age beyond which it's going to be more difficult to socialize a cat? Um, after it gets to be several months old, I'd say four, five, six months old, then it gets harder and harder to socialize. I think it's still possible. I, I've socialized complete ferals that were adults already, but um, it's much more difficult. So while you can still tell that they're a kitten and as young as possible, you know, if possible from one or two months, um, I think there's still plenty of socialization that you can do. Um, but after three, four, five, six months, uh, it just gets progressively harder. Yeah. So I was very surprised by Nora. I'd never seen anything like that. Is, have you ever had a, an experience where the cat that was really beyond the age where they, they suddenly become more social just decided to socialize themselves? I'm not sure. I have two cats in my life that I caught as, an, as adults and that were extremely social. But I, I wonder if they had something in their past where they were friendly with humans. So one of them is my Lily, my Leo that you know. Uh, he was five or six when we found him at a rest area, um, eating onigiris that old ladies would leave out for him. And he, the, the staff said he was running back and forth across the highway to the other rest area. Uh, so when I heard that, I said, no, this will not stand. And I took him home and he was, you know, very cuddly and um, friendly right away even though I found him on the street. And then the other one is my parents um, have a cat they call Tom. <laughs> you know, very creative name here, <laughs> Tom. And uh, Tom was a grizzled old street cat who had all these scars and you know, his ears scraggly from fighting. But, um, and he, he seemed to be a grouchy old man when they first found him. But uh, as soon as he got inside and realized that it was a Tabe Holdai, all you can eat buffet, and that it was warm and it was soft blankets, he said, screw this, I'm not going back outside. And he quickly uh, became domesticated. So I think sometimes they just realize, oh, you have, I don't have to scavenge for food. I don't have to scrounge. Like, um, you're, you're pretty nice and you wait on me hand and foot. Well, maybe this isn't so bad. Absolutely. So when you guys were in Hiroshima, um, how what was the mix of cats you took in because you took in strays but you also had to take in people's pets didn't you because they were being evacuated and there was nowhere for the pets to go yeah so at, so i was in fukushima starting in around um april or so of that year and we were up um, establishing a base we established a base in inawashiro which is about an hour outside of the, it took about an hour to drive to the 30 kilometer zone. And um, at, at first it was a lot of pets. There were a lot of people who had to leave their homes very quickly and they didn't have time to even evacuate Thank their you pets. So much. So we will continue the discussion. I noticed there was an interesting question um, from Dave in Osaka about how you get uh, existing pets comfortable with new adopted pets? And I thought that was a nice question. Selena? Uh, um, yeah, Elizabeth and I were talking about this a little offline. So it, it can be really tough. Um, and especially with ferals, uh, if they're mad, they might pee or scratch. And that's that can be so challenging. But one thing that you can do, and I think that Elizabeth was doing with Cassie and Nora, is having them in separate rooms with a door between so that they can smell and hear each other and get used to the idea of each other without having to share space. So they're not going to fight that way. They can just, um, you know, talk through the door, <laughs> but still have their own territory. So that's one tip that I would have. Elizabeth, anything else? 
that that would be i mean i haven't really had to do it very often um but with Nora and Cassie, they seem to get along pretty well. And I think one of the keys there was that initially Nora was only on the balcony, but there was the um, the insect mesh between them so they could smell each other, uh, but they were not in each other's space. And so by the time I pulled the insect mesh back and I let Nora into the apartment, I was reasonably sure they were going to be okay because they'd been sniffing noses a lot and Cassie seemed really happy when she saw Nora. So I thought, there was a fair chance that they they wouldn't have any problems when they could actually get into each other's space. Have you guys noticed anything with uh, males and females having certain issues? Because we adopted um, two males and one female in the litter the first time, and then one was adopted, uh, the, one of the males off to Dave and Osaka, so we have a male and female and then two males from the second litter. Now, luckily, the second litter of kittens, they love the older cats, and the older cats love the kittens, so they all get along really well. But the first litter male cat, Gary, his name is, my daughter named him Gary, I don't know why, um, he does not get along with the mama cats, like even his own mother cat is has friction i don't know for what reason um and our female cat from the first litter does not get along with the mama cats who come around for regular feedings outside um so have you guys noticed that as well any friction between male and female cats i think it depends on a lot of things, uh, spay neuter status, you know, they're going to be more aggressive when they're not spay or neutered. So um, my experience is that if you have two males, especially if one or both of them is not neutered, they can be very territorial. Same with two females. Um, but yeah, if they're older, then they're already going to establish their territory and they're set in their ways. So um, I, yeah, it, it really depends. Mm. It's just case by case, right? Like, and and then sometimes we'll get, um, and all of these cats that I'm talking about, they're all spayed and neutered. The mama cats that I feed, I had them spayed, neutered, or released, and I still regularly feed them. And it's really sweet. The kittens will go out and play with their their mom um, sometimes. So it's it's nice to see them play in the garden and then come back in and, and, you know, be pets inside the house. So having that indoor outdoor seems to work in our case, but I know, you know, I have to be more careful about fleas and ticks. I have to use the monthly medicine. Um, I'm taking them regularly to the vet to be checked and hope they don't go too far and get into fights and stuff. But uh, having cats only domesticated only inside is definitely a safer option. But for me, I, I feel bad that they don't have time with their mom, but maybe I'm just being too soft. <laughs> have you guys um, just domesticated and once domesticated only inside? Do you have that kind of rule? So I do. I used to be very much, I had outdoor cats for years and I thought, um, you know, they're happy out there and they are, you know, some of them really do like being outside. But as you said, it's so much safer. Um, I have I've lost cats um, that have gotten in fights or gotten run over by cars or, um, you know, it where my parents live in Oregon, coyotes are problems. So coyotes eat stray cats, kill stray cats. Um, here, they're more likely to tangle with a tanuki or something like that. But I've had that happen as well. So um, if you have outdoor cats, uh, unfortunately, you need to be prepared to lose them um, and to have them die from something like that. That is a real problem and it's a reality. So um, indoor cats can live very happy lives. Elizabeth's seen my house. Uh, we are a little bit um, extra in that we have like, we've built shelves into the walls that they can climb all over the place. And we actually built a catio um, outside of my window so that they can have some outdoor space that's screened in and protected. Um, so I don't feel bad at all keeping them indoors. That's a really good idea. I'd love, I'd love to do that because we have a terrace 
Um, so having an enclosed place, maybe where mom could come in and visit and then mom could go out um, because mom, the moms are too wild to be domesticated. I can now lightly touch the head of the first mom from two years ago while she eats, but that's it. Like she won't let me go any further. Um, but when you're keeping them inside 24 seven, what are some things that you can do um, to help protect your house? Because uh, Elizabeth, you must have had to do this. It's like when before you have a new baby, there's certain things you have to do to protect the cats, but also to keep certain spaces uh, cat free for you, right? Uh, not really. I've never no? had any problems. Oh, no. Wow. Hmm. I mean, I put down plenty of scratch pads so that they've got good choices for scratching, but the scratch pads are preferable to furniture in most cases. So I've never had any trouble at all. Um, when I, in the UK, uh, where I grew up, it's most cats are outdoor cats. Like, it's very unusual to keep a cat permanently indoors. We don't really have any wildlife threats. We do, of course, have cars, which are a problem. Um, but there's there's no real predators in the UK, mainly. There's occasionally foxes, but that's about it. Uh, so it was a very strange idea to me to keep a cat completely indoors. And my first cat I adopted alone. I was in the States. And she'd never been outside. I got her from a shelter as well. So I didn't want to leave her. I didn't want to let her outside because I knew she'd never been outside before. So I followed the shelter's advice and I kept her indoors. Um, and I was worried that she wouldn't be as happy because suddenly our cat at home enjoyed going outside very much. But actually, I never saw any signs that she was unsatisfied or, or stressed or miserable. She seemed very happy indoors and very uh, confident and I asked the shelter and they said look at the end of the day cats care most about one thing they care about safety so if they feel safe indoors then you sh they shouldn't really feel they were missing out and they won't necessarily want to want to go out uh, with Talis um, the cat I adopted in the States she normally didn't even try to go out the only time that was different is at one point we had an apartment where there was no windows on the side of the door so she would see me go out through the door, but she couldn't see where I was going. It was like this mysterious black portal I just passed through. And then occasionally she would try and escape through there, I think out of curiosity. But the one time she succeeded, this was in Florida and we had a hurricane. So she shot out and shot back in again. And I was like, that is what it's like outside always. You should never go. <laughs> and after that, she, she just stayed indoors. Um, but the next apartment we had, it had a window in the door so she could see that, you know, it wasn't actually that exciting out there. And um, so since then, I've, I've lost my reservations about keeping cats indoors. They seem to be very happy. It doesn't seem to be a problem. Cassie doesn't really have um, an escape bug. She's the cat I adopted from the JCN. Uh, once I actually accidentally left the patio door open, I'd had it open for Nora. And I left it open and forgotten about it. And the reason I realized this was that I put a balcony webcam outside so that I could uh, keep an eye on the visitors I had in the balcony. And I happened to be looking at this in my phone and I saw Cassie stick her head out the door. And I was like, oh my goodness, I've left the door open. And so I, I moved across, but when Cassie saw me, she just sort of shrugged and walked back inside again. <laughs> like she didn't really, she wasn't really that bothered about going out. So I got a bit lucky there, I have to say. But it does prove as well that cats can be very happy indoors and they're not desperate to go outside. Wow, good advice there. Um, also, we talked about neutering, but we didn't talk about shots. So when you uh, capture a stray cat to take them in for TNR, do you also uh, pay to get the shots done? Um, I do. The vet offers... Um, different choices when we go in uh, with a form that Selena helps me translate every time because my Japanese remains really poor. Uh, there's the basic spay and neutering, which is 5,000 yen for our vet. Um, but you can also go for the sort of deluxe, which is which is what I, I tend to do. And what do we get with that, Selena? We get a three-in-one vaccination and we get um, some pesticide treatment as well in case they have stomach problems. Um, and then I often test for um, FIV and FELV. You can't really do anything about those, but because occasionally the cats become friendly and I've thought about adopting them, I've realized it's quite good to know if they are positive or not. Yes, so we, all, we get the flea tick treatment, the uh, stomach roundworm treatment revolution usually, um, the ear tipping, the surgery, and a vaccine. 
and the test. And I think all of that at our vet is about 14,000. That's very reasonable. I just got a notice uh, for Gallet, Lani, TikTok, who are my four rescue kittens to go in for their shots. And so I'm, I'm now bracing for probably 40,000 yen, um, f at least for their updates on shots. So when you do take in uh, pets, and these are pets for life, hopefully, when you're committing to them, um, you do have to kind of budget to have that funding um, to cover their shots because it's an important part of having them as pets, right? Yeah, something that we always say when we're ad adopting out animals um, in the various rescues that I've worked with is when you take an animal in, you need to think of it as a 10 to 20 year commitment. So um, a lot of people don't really have that in their mind when they first take on an animal, but that is how long it's probably going to live. And you need to be prepared to, um, to you know, have a good life together for at least that long. Now. Selena, you said um, you've got to go in a few minutes. I'm sorry, this is going a bit longer than scheduled. Uh, is there anything we haven't really touched on or any general advice that you would give people who are thinking about uh, capturing a stray cat and doing TNR or maybe thinking about uh, adopting? Um, like I said, go, go ahead and look at the JCN Japan Cat Network uh, Facebook page to find people to commiserate with and share tips. You can message me or probably Elizabeth on Twitter. I don't want to volunteer for you, but um, I, I'm sure we'd be happy to share some tips, you know, over DMs. Um, it, it can be daunting at first, but you get used to it pretty quick. Yeah, absolutely. I, I'd never TNR'd a cat before the end of last year. Um, so, and I would say it's not hard and it's not that expensive and all you need to do is find a vet who is experienced with TNR and a trap. And both of those can be found through organizations such as the JCN website, uh, Facebook page. Excellent. And I think even the, the trap, uh, because of our break, I had the chance to go and grab it. <laughs> even the trap that I got is uh, 5,000 yen off of Amazon. So it wasn't that bad. I got the nice big one so they'd have lots of space. It's not that difficult to work out. Uh, there are great YouTube tutorials and then uh, tips like I got offline telling you to put a bottle in and with a long string and pull it uh, to make sure that you, you trap them at the right time. So there's a lot of great uh, online resources and a lot of great resources for Japan. And I think um, Selena and Elizabeth, I really appreciate following what you guys are doing and all of your advice, because of course it's it's specific to your area, but there's a lot of general advice um, from your experiences in Japan, which we could apply to other parts of Japan. And I would, finally, I'd say um, when you do TNR, it improves the cat's life. It improves the, the neighborhood colony um, because you're going to have fewer cats, like Elizabeth said, you know, yowling and making messes around the neighborhood, which will make the neighbors less pissed off. And then, um, you know, you're going to reduce the number of animals that die horrible deaths, either in the elements or, you know, by being gassed at the pound. So I really think it's a win-win-win situation. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's worth remembering that we are cat lovers, but not everyone is. So if the cats are making a lot of noise or they're seen to be you know, around a lot and destructive, then there are people who just won't care what happens. They just want them out in the neighborhood. So those are when you end up with perfectly healthy cats and kittens being gassed, which is just, just awful. So if you TNR, you keep the population down. So the people who like cats, that's all fine. And the people who don't like cats aren't really bothered by them. And then they can live much longer lives, much healthier lives. And it, it, you, you stop dead kittens. 
And it's, it's a community service too. Like you said, uh, people don't like the loud uh, cat calls at night and uh, having, you know, cats uh, poo or pee around their houses. Uh, you often see people's houses with lots of water bottles around to try to keep them away, right? Um, so when you do take this on, it's it, you're doing a community service. You're doing something good for your community. And most of my neighbors seem very appreciative that I've become the TNR person and trying to find homes for the cats because they know it's a problem. And a lot of people have that attitude like, oh, it's not my problem. I can't deal with it. But it is really everybody's problem, right? And you can deal with it. I mean, I think that's people just don't know what to do as well. But actually, the action is not difficult and anyone can do it. And it won't take up that much of your time and it won't cost you a fortune. And, you know, be bold. You can do it. Yeah. Absolutely. Any final words, Selena? Thank you so much for having us on today. And um, I love cats. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Thank you so much, Selena. Great advice. And anybody who's watching, if you have more questions or comments, feel free to write them below and we'll try to respond and uh, add useful links for you. Everyone, have a wonderful catter day. Go and love some cats and uh, we'll see you next time. Take care. Bye.